but as we've seen in a number of countries, if the economy is not doing well, political uh, prospects uh, very quickly uh, get dark and uh, governments fall. So what we'll be talking about uh, today has a lot of uh, implications for uh, the political processes in uh, virtually all European countries and also to a large extent uh, of uh, the prospects of countries they are related either for the trade or for foreign direct investment or for some sort of uh, political support to the European Union including a country like uh, Georgia. The way that I thought of organizing the uh, discussion is first to uh, tell you a bit of my first-hand experience as a finance minister in uh, the European Union on the topic of the Eurozone, as you know, because of the, by now, several countries that have uh, essentially gone bankrupt in the Eurozone countries like Greece, like Portugal, like um, Ireland, Cyprus, the latest one, Spain to some extent. Uh, the topic of whether the Eurozone is uh, going to exist in its current format or somehow is going to collapse uh, has been probably the main topic for discussion last year among finance people, economics people, political people, and so on. And just as it seemed early this year that this is not going to be the number one topic, that there are other problems in the rest of the world that are going to dominate uh, Europe, the uh, recent events in first Italy, where, as you know, the election ended up with a stalemate, basically nobody can govern Italy. Uh, at least for now, and the more recent event just of two weeks ago in Cyprus showed that uh, the Eurozone is again probably going to be the number one problematic topic uh, in the world in 20, 2013. So I plan to organize the talk in three, uh, three steps. First, talk about the Euro itself, Euro as a currency, Euro as a construct, how it came about, what are the problems with the Euro, and uh, how uh, the Eurozone and the European Union are trying to solve them. The second part of the topic is a topic familiar to some of you from my previous uh, work at the World Bank, uh, which is on uh, doing business. And the main point there would be that so far everybody has been looking at the uh, crisis in Europe as essentially a financial crisis. So a crisis of the currency, the euro, a crisis of budget deficits, which is public finances. So if you could solve the financial problems, basically you would not have, um, have a 
another problem. But what is increasingly becoming evident is that the crisis in uh, the European Union as a whole and in the Eurozone uh, in particular is actually a crisis of uh, lack of competitiveness. Uh, that essentially, even if the current financial problems are resolved in another five to ten years, the European Union will have another crisis, maybe not as severe as this one, but certainly a major crisis. And that is because uh, a number, a large number of European countries, the economies are not competitive enough to compete not only with China, the US, uh, uh, and so on, but to compete to be part of a single currency like, uh, like the Euro. So that's the second part of the discussion. And then at the very end, uh, I will also um, draw a few implications, as I mentioned, for countries that are not in the Eurozone, uh, Bulgaria incidentally is not in the Eurozone, are not in the European uh, Union, but very much depend on uh, investment uh, and on uh, trade uh, on the European Union. One such country is, uh, is uh, Georgia. So I'll start with, uh, with the Eurozone. Um, by now and in my previous actually um, events here at, uh, at the Free University about two years ago, I think I had a lecture before that, I've had a couple of lectures here at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, we all described the current and ongoing financial crisis as a crisis that originated uh, in the United States, came to Europe, um, for a variety of reasons was uh, made a lot more uh, difficult and a lot longer in Europe than in most other regions uh, in the world. And now we are in our sixth year of, um, of a crisis. Um, why is this important? Because if you go back to economic history and look at the last hundred years uh, and ask the question, how long does the typical financial crisis last? The answer is about 18 to 20 months, or so less than two years. Even the most severe crises have not typically last more than uh, two years. The last most severe crisis, called the Great Depression, lasted about five years. Um, uh, by now, we, as I mentioned, in a sixth year of this crisis, for some countries like Greece, this is the seventh year. So this is, in other words, at least for some European countries, the longest uh, crisis that uh, they have uh, ever, ever experienced. Uh, and this is why uh, the, com the conversation that we're going uh, to have today uh, and increasingly seen by many European politicians, they come to realize that this is not just because of finance, because if it was just a problem of banking or just a problem of public finance, then this crisis should have been long gone. But it isn't. In some countries, in, uh, in a way, it is only starting, as we see the current problems in uh, Cyprus. The Cyprus finance ministry essentially uh, uh, resigned actually about an hour ago. He was finance minister for about two weeks. The previous finance minister there lasted for about a week. So it tells you that <laughs> that soon if uh, you should finish your finance degree and uh, go to Cyprus, probably your turn will be uh, uh, soon the way that they're uh, the way that they're going. So, but what's first the problem with uh, the euro itself? So the euro started, uh, actually a long time ago it was discussed with the creation of the European Economic Community in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, it then was discussed a lot in the 70s, but really started in 1999. Um, the history is important because uh, when the European Economic Community was established, even then in 1959, uh, the idea of, uh, of a common uh, monetary policy, essentially, uh, common currency was discussed. And it was discussed from a very philosophical perspective, roughly speaking. In the past, actually, Europe was united many centuries ago, and it was united under the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had its own uh, currency, had its own uh, infrastructure, had its own monetary policy, maybe a fiscal policy, and so on. So when the um, first architects of the European Economic Community and later the European Union thought about uh, uh, United Europe, they actually had something in mind, uh, historical, and that was the Roman uh, Empire. Um, but uh, it was not the Roman Empire that necessitated this political will to establish a common currency. It was the 
dominance of the US dollar and in general the US monetary policy in the world in the following the Second World War in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Basically the world was a, a large dollar economy. Everything depended on the dollar. Uh, lots of commodities like uh, gas and uh, oil depended on the dollar as they do today. Um, the precious met metals depended on the dollar as they do today. But also uh, until the early 70s, uh, uh, the world was on a so-called gold standard. And the gold standard was uh, um, a relatively strange, I would say, concept, but behind it was a pact to the dollar. So every country essentially had the dollar as its um, ultimate um, ultimate currency should any issues uh, arise. There was no other uh, currency uh, around. That was first, as I mentioned, because of the gold standard, and second, because after the Second World War, um, the European economies uh, as well as the Asian economies were uh, ruined. Uh, while the U.S. economy, because there was no fight on U.S. Um, uh, soil, was actually quite uh, dominant and it generated more than 40% of foreign trade. Now it's hard to imagine it, but in the 60s and early 70s, uh, the U.S. Uh, exports were about 40%, a bit more than 40% of foreign trade. And because you need an international currency to uh, do this trade, the dollar really dominated uh, the 50s, 60s and 70s. The problem started, this was a political problem for United Europe, because you cannot say we are creating essentially United States of Europe, but then will depend on the dollar, that sounded politically not that uh, uh, brave. Um, but the additional problem with that was uh, the um, oil shocks that started in the early 70s and then actually um, uh, followed in the late 70s, early 80s, that uh, affected a lot more the European economies than they affected the US uh, uh, economy because the US economy had the dollar and had the monetary policy associated with it. Uh, so the Federal Reserve could try at least uh, in part to, uh, to change its uh, monetary policy in response to the uh, scarcity of uh, oil while the uh, European Union or what was then a number of countries in the European economic communities uh, community could not. So as a result, the recessions that, that were in the early 70s, late 70s, early 80s in, uh, in Europe were a lot deeper than they were in uh, the United uh, States. And hence, uh, I need this later, don't worry. Uh, and hence, um, uh, then in the late uh, 70s, 1978 to be uh, exact, um, the head of uh, the European uh, Commission decided that they should have a panel and decide on uh, adoption of the euro. And by and large, the euro as a philosophical concept was created in 1979. It took until 1999 for it to, uh, for a series of, uh, of changes to exist. Uh, first as a store of value, and 2002 was the first time that you actually had, uh, had uh, euros. Uh, I'm telling you all this story for a, a reason, and the reason is the following, that once you have a common currency, you, or once you have uh, uh, such a big uh, development in terms of uh, policy, European policy, you must have thought hard about what, why you need this. And as I mentioned, one reason was purely political. You cannot create a, a large uh, uh, common area, economic area, but also political area, without having a symbol for it. So the euro, many, many politicians, most European politicians, at the time thought that the euro is the ultimate symbol of Europe. That if you don't have a common currency, if you don't have the euro, it's hard to imagine being European. You can be German, French, and Italian, and so on, but you cannot be European. So a big part of the creation of the euro was purely political. It had nothing to do with the economic uh, uh, background. The second part uh, was uh, a comparison with the United States and saying, well, in the United States there are also, there are also a number of states, 50 states. Um, they are quite different, so if you go to Louisiana or Alabama, they are poorer than if you go to New York or to Massachusetts. So, so if they manage to exist in such a monetary union, Europe surely uh, can, uh, can create a monetary union uh, too, especially since Europe on average at the time 
was richer than, uh, than uh, the United States. But they looked at how uh, the US uh, created uh, uh, common currency, the dollar, and then what uh, was uh, underpinning the dollar, and basically said, rightly said so, if you have a free movement of capital and free movement of labor, of workers, then you should be able to create uh, a common um, a currency, since again it works in the uh, US. So 1999, the euro is accepted as a common currency. 2002, you already have the euro um, established as uh, coins and, uh, and banknotes. You start with a few countries, and over time, by now, 17 countries are part of, um, of uh, the eurozone. Right from the start, however, any reasonable economist, or virtually all uh, American economists, or UK economists, and even some German and French economists, to the extent they existed, said that the Eurozone is not going to be successful as, um, as, a, as a currency area. For two reasons. The first reason is that, unlike the United States, there is never going to be free capital and labor mobility in, uh, in Europe. You can come close over time to that, but it's never going to be like in the US. Why? Well, because we have uh, different uh, languages to begin. Uh, we have different uh, religions. For some it matters, for some it doesn't matter. But it's not the same going from, uh, from uh, let's say, Massachusetts to Arkansas, which basically just take your car and drive, and everywhere you have the same shops, everywhere you have the same hotels, everywhere you have the same... Uh, uh, language everywhere you have the same banks. It's not the same if you start uh, driving from Finland, let's say, to Portugal. You would, if you go from Finland to Portugal, you'll go through eight different languages. Um, and uh, around you, a lot of things will be uh, quite different. Maybe Starbucks will be the same, uh, McDonald's will be the same, but many, many other things will be on the way. And as a result, labor mobility in uh, Europe, these economists argued them, would always be a lot lower than it uh, is in the US. Um, and in fact it is. It is about five times lower even as of last year than it is in the US. In the US, this is actually a striking statistic. In the US, in any one year, about 12% of the population moves from one state to another to either live or study long term, not just for vacation, but moves from one state to another. So 12% 12, 12 of about 300 uh, million people, that's nearly 40 million Americans every year move their home from one state to another. In Europe, in the European Union, that percent is about 2 to 2.5%. Two uh, so about 9 million uh, Europeans every year move from, let's say, Germany to Bulgaria, from Bulgaria to Portugal, and so on. The percentage is a lot smaller. So even if by construct the idea of labor mobility is present in the European Union, it's a lot lower than, uh, than it is in the United States. Why this is important for the Euro? Well, because economic theory teaches you that if one region, Greece, let's say, has uh, uh, problems with its economy, the easiest thing for people to do is to just move to where the economy is uh, actually doing well, so that they will move to Germany or they will move to uh, uh, Estonia, which is now doing very well, and that would somehow equi equilibrate the European economy. But that does not happen in Europe to the extent that it happens in uh, the example that the Eurozone architects were following uh, the US. Capital also doesn't move in Europe uh, as much as uh, it uh, moves in the United States. It moves. Uh, uh, capital in the U.S. moves about 12 times more from one state to another than it moves to uh, within uh, within Europe. There are a number of explanations for uh, this. Um, it's less less interesting story, but what you should remember from this part of the discussion is that neither capital nor labor in Europe move as much as they move in the U.S. And that creates a problem with the common currency, especially during crisis, because neither your capital nor your labor can move to where they can find uh, the, best, uh, the best opportunities. A lot of it just stays and waits for the crisis to, uh, uh, to finish. Um, so right in 1999, by all of these discussions, virtually all meaningful economists um, said that this is a problem. The politicians disregarded it and continued. The politicians had one somewhat valid point, which they said, we understand that 
but what we can create within the European Union is transfers, budgetary transfers. So basically from Brussels, we'll be pumping a lot of money into Greece, Portugal, Spain, uh, over time Romania, Bulgaria, and so on. And with this money, these countries, this additional money, grants basically, these countries can uh, develop their uh, social services, healthcare, infrastructure, and so on to keep the people there. And indeed, if you look at the last uh, 20 years, for example, for Greece, you would see that every year Greece received more than 15% of its GDP in transfers from uh, Brussels. So in addition to what Greece produced, some years it received 16%, some years 19%, some years 15%, but Greece has received a lot of its income uh, purely as transfers from, uh, from Brussels. Um, this has had two effects, however. One, it turns out not to be enough. So if you want to have transfers and for people to stay where they are, uh, visa studies in the US, it shows that you need uh, transfers in the poor regions, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, and so on, to be something in the order of 30 to 40% of their income. There are a lot of studies in the US uh, looking at this, and it turns out that the transfers have to be a lot higher than they were uh, in Europe. But you get to the point of, is it politically feasible? And the answer is no, it's not politically feasible. As you can see now, uh, Chancellor Merkel, the Finnish Prime Minister, the Dutch, and so on, saying we are fed up giving money to Greece or Spain or Portugal or Cyprus. And basically, in return, not get the European Union, they are polite, so they don't say it exactly that way, but the European Union not getting solidarity from, uh, from them. It's a lot easier to do transfers in your country because then patriotism works uh, and it's easier to explain in the US how when Hurricane Katrina hits, you give a lot of transfers to, uh, uh, to Louisiana, it's part of your population. It's a lot more difficult politically to go to the Dutch parliament and say, Greece is for a seventh year in a row in trouble, so let's give them some money because immediately the issue becomes, well, why should we give them money? Let's use it uh, uh, our ourselves. So the transfer idea was actually recognized as a possible uh, direction that can keep people where, where they are, and not everybody going to Germany, let's say. But it turns out that it's never been politically accept acceptable enough to be uh, meaningful. And secondly, and I'm going to the second part of the discussion, even if there were a lot larger transfers to these Southern Rim uh, countries and maybe some other countries, probably they have been wasted, would have been uh, wasted. This was the political suspicion in the, in the Western um, countries. It's, it's, it's certainly now a lot deeper suspicion. So when you, just earlier today, some um, uh, journalists were asking Chancellor Merkel what she thinks of, uh, of Cyprus and Greece and so on, and her direct quote was, we are tired of being the, the only adults in the European family. In other words, we, the Germans, behave like the uh, parents, and everybody else seems to be behaving like uh, children. And, you know, we can only do this for so long and for so, uh, for so much. So this is the current feeling, not just in Germany, but in a number of uh, the Netherlands, Finland, uh, Sweden, and so on, the countries that have been the bigger uh, donors to the... Um, European uh, community. Um, so only in the last, I would say, few months, a topic that here in Georgia has been going on for about 10 years, and I've been part of it uh, in my previous experience at uh, the World Bank, uh, the topic of competitiveness had started, has started coming to uh, Europe. And the topic comes in the following way. As I mentioned, so far, till very recently, when you discuss the Eurozone crisis in Europe, it was purely discussed in monetary terms, the terms that I described so far. So you create a currency, it has some problems, it turns out the problems are larger than uh, politicians uh, uh, accepted, even though all, virtually all the economists from the start said these problems will exist. There was, let's say, a recipe for dealing with these uh, problems, which was the transfer mechanism through the European funds. It turns out that they are not enough in economic terms, but politically they were more than enough, so politicians don't want donor from donor countries don't want to give more. And you end up with a currency that doesn't work, roughly speaking. 
So then the next question is, well, what would, you, what would it make that currency uh, to work? And in the last four years since I've become finance minister, every month at least once, sometimes once and sometimes twice, with the finance ministers met in Brussels or Luxembourg or uh, many other places to discuss what can make this currency work. And there are several answers. The one most immediate answer, uh, which follows on all the discussion I mentioned so far, is that it's not enough to have a common monetary policy like the euro. You also have, you also need to have, like the US, for example, has a common fiscal policy. So in other words, you need to have a common budget. Um, imagine that just like Georgia has a national budget, Bulgaria has a national uh, budget, Germany and so on and it's uh, adopted in, in the parliaments of these countries. Imagine now that there is one common uh, uh, budget for the whole European Union and it, and it is adopted in, um, in Brussels. At first you say this is never going to happen in Europe and to some extent I think years will probably decades will pass before uh, uh, Europe has a common, uh, a common uh, fiscal, fiscal budget because some countries want uh, uh, want to spend their money differently from others because it's not in the original Treaty of Rome, so the whole treaty will have to be changed, every country will uh, have to agree to it, and uh, so on. But, uh, but this is the direction in which uh, um, the discussion has been moving over the last two years, pushed very much by Germany. Germany basically saying, okay, if you want us to help you, just like the US, they don't say it like that uh, explicitly, but we also need to have a common uh, fiscal set of uh, rules. We, we also uh, want to move towards a common budget. Some small steps have been made in that uh, regard. For example, one step that happened from January this year is the so-called golden rules, which basically say that everybody should follow a deficit below 3% of GDP in any one year, and debt to GDP below uh, 60%. Uh, in passing, I'll mention that Bulgaria already two years ago accepted much stri stricter rules, deficit below 2% and uh, uh, debt to GDP below um, uh, 40%. But from this January, it is now obligatory in every country in the European Union, in their national uh, legislation and mainly in their constitutions, to put these rules. Uh, the interesting uh, second note here is that if, as of the end of 2012, you ask the question how many countries in the Eurozone fulfill that criteria, I'm going to ask you whether you can guess uh, how many countries fulfill that criteria, I'll tell you now. None of the 17 countries last year fulfilled the uh, uh, Golden Rules uh, criteria. Estonia was closed, but once it entered the European Union, it immediately uh, passed. Uh, uh, above some of these uh, uh, criteria. And now there has been a continuing discussion on how step by step we are going to go towards uh, common uh, fiscal policy. As I mentioned, my view is that it's going to take years, decades perhaps, for this to happen, but it is one direction. Even if that were to succeed, uh, suppose that it, uh, it succeeds in a few years, there is another problem which is perhaps a lot bigger and people just now recognize it, which is that so if you have a common fiscal policy, you would now be able, uh, in theory, to move money just like in the US if one area is hit by a natural disaster or by economic downturn, you would be able for a short period of time to move money to it so that uh, people still find employment there, so that businesses work there. Uh, and so that economic activity does not die. But this is uh, uh, presupposed by uh, uh, the following question. Uh, and this is the second part of my lecture. The question is the following. Is there business activity in some parts of Europe? And you end up, once you ask this question, you realize that it's not trivial in that there are a number of economies in Europe. Greece is commonly given as an example. Lately, Cyprus is given as an example that there isn't much business. Business in the sense of um, manufacturing business, businesses that produce something and then sell it. So if you think of Greece, uh, here I'm just repeating things that have been uh, said by the way, especially by the Germans and Dutch and so on. If you think of Greece, what do you imagine? Well, Greece has tourism, so you imagine the Acropolis, some other uh, 
stones, ancient stones put on top of each other. You imagine some beaches, you imagine olive oil, you imagine strikes of different types of workers, um, and that's about it. Actually, if you think of what you have used as an export from Greece other than olive oil, I challenge any one of you to come up with a second, uh, second uh, export. Think of Cyprus. I mentioned, so tourism, yes, so there is the beaches and so on. So tourism is indeed a very large, about 16% of, um, of, uh, of GDP. So, so basically, you have tourism and you have olive oil. It's a, it's a two um, product economy, uh, a large tourist uh, sector and some agriculture. I mean olive oil, but it's agricultural sector. There are some other products outside of that. But that's it. Think of anything that you actually buy that's produced in, uh, in, uh, in Greece, uh, product. You cannot really come up with uh, one. Think of um, Cyprus. Cyprus is, well, it's a much smaller part of the discussion because it's more recent. You've probably read in the media a number of interesting descriptions of Cyprus. The French, my colleague from France, the French finance minister, called it a casino economy. Basically, you go there as a tourist, play in the casinos and then, um, and then uh, leave. The Dutch uh, finance minister called it uh, Iceland without the fisheries. So basically it's an island that you have lots of beaches, but you don't have even uh, fisheries. So um, uh, outside of the uh, beaches, nothing, nothing else. Cyprus itself, um, the, uh, Cyprus has one very top economist who just last year got the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, Chris Pisaridis, he is now an advisor to the president, to the new president, and he described it as uh, tourism uh, plus business services. But what are the business services in uh, Cyprus? They have very low, uh, very low tax rates, maybe for another 10 days or so, and will increase tremendously, is my guess. But they have very low tax rates, and they have, let's say, lax banking rules, so anybody particularly from Russia, let's say, can go and put a lot of money there without them asking where this money came uh, from. What else does Cyprus produce? And it turns out that we cannot think of uh, other, other things. So it's again, it's a too staple, too product uh, uh, economy. And that turns out to be a big problem over time because if Tourism is cyclical, seasonal, uh, I mean, if it happens that the tourists who are coming to your country stop coming, either because your transport workers are always on strike, as the case of uh, Greece, or because the tourists in Cyprus are also coming to put quietly some money in the banks and then enjoy some time at the beach, but the banks now are closed, bankrupt, uh, and, and tax rates would increase, so the tourists would not be coming. And other than tourism, what do you have? The problem in some of the other countries is not that, that uh, strong, but is actually equally, equally um, uh, uh, useful for discussion. For example, Portugal. What does Portugal produce? Um, when I was first asked the question about a month ago, I started thinking and couldn't actually, other than port, the drink like uh, wine and port, couldn't think of something that I'm using from from Portugal. Again, they have some beaches, but not so much. They have some olives, but not so much as, uh, as Greece, and not much, not much else in terms of actual uh, products. And you can go country by country. I'm not, by the way, trying just to belittle these countries to say that they don't have anything. I'm just saying what the discussion is. What can you develop as a business in these countries? Which business can you support? And the answer is not that much. Not that many businesses actually exist in these countries, apart from the service sector. So there is a large sector that supports tourism. It's not only hotels. You also have uh, transport. You have uh, healthcare that's related to the tourists and so on. But if you abstract from all of that and ask the question, manufacturing, what does actually come out of these countries? And it turns out the answer is not that uh, not that much. And that turns out to be a very big problem, and it is also a very big problem for the future of the euro. Why? Because for the average economy, if you say, well, we want uh, this economy to have large employment, so we're going to give some money for the fiscal policy, let's say, for these people to stay there, you need to ask the question, 
what would attract businesses to start operation there, not just local businesses, but also foreign businesses. And here's a question that, uh, that I put in front of you. Say that you want Greece really to develop um, and uh, have from the current level of about 28% unemployment to go to reasonable levels of unemployment, 6%, let's say, 5 6%. Where would these people go? Who would invest in businesses so that these people can be uh, employed? How do you sell it to a businessman from the Netherlands or from Bulgaria or from Austria to come to uh, Greece and establish a business? And this is where the doing business part, let me see what I can show it now. Now is the time for huh? something showed up. This is where the doing business part and the regulatory part comes. Thank you. So this is from the, doing, the latest doing business report that just came uh, last October and it looks at some basic indicators. By now many of you should know doing business, I hope. Um, I spent a lot of my time in the past uh, developing it, but it basically says, imagine that you're starting a new business in uh, Greece. How long would it take? How much would it cost you? How many steps do you have to go through? Imagine, I'll show you now some of these things uh, in more detail. Imagine that you have some uh, disagreement with a business partner in Greece, uh, which is the enforcing contracts indicator, how long it would take you to resolve it, how much it would cost you, and how, how many different bureaucratic procedures you would have to go through. And the Doing Business Report every year ranks 180, by now maybe 87 countries, uh, on these indicators. And the answer is, you would never do business in Greece. Uh, why? Because uh, of these 185 or 87, 85 countries, it says uh, here, Greece is actually ranked 140, uh, Greece is, is ranked uh, about number 80, number 70 something, but if you start from the first indicator, I hope you see the starting of business, Greece is ranked 146th, so basically I'm trying to show you the actual. I'm trying to show you the actual steps. So it would take you, I think, eleven procedures to do this. It would take you eleven days to start just starting a very simple business. This is not a banking business. This is, you know, you're starting a, a basically a store on the beach to sell inflatable balls and this kind of stuff. So it would take you 11 days, it would take you 11 different procedures and it would cost you between the paid in capital and the cost, it would cost you about half of, um, of your GDP. The GDP of Greece is rapidly falling but uh, let me just show you what's I knew what the GDP of Greece was, but it's fell quite a lot, so it's uh, about $25,000, so it basically cost you about uh, $13,000 to start a basic business. Well, not many people who are just starting a business. Imagine that you're a student and you just have finished, you have a good idea, you want to start a business. Well, it would cost you $30,000 just to be able to open it. Actually, it would cost you more, because in addition to the just purely starting a business procedures, you probably need to have... Uh, some sort of a, a contract for your <coughs> building, which is an additional procedure. You need some other um, uh, licenses and uh, so on. But the point of uh, these uh, statistics, and there are a number of different uh, statistics, this is why I go through and basically say, for me to be attracted, look at the statistic on registering property. So of 185 countries, this includes 40 some countries in um, in Africa, um, um, Greece is uh, ranked 150 from this uh, indicator. Look at the indicator on uh, protecting investors, which is one of the indicators that if you're coming from abroad, you would certainly look at. But Greece is ranked 117th uh, of 185 countries. Basically, an investor from abroad probably would not go to invest in, uh, in, uh, in Greece. 
Um, of course, you're not only use doing business indicators, you use indicators on the levels, the perceived level of corruptions in the, uh, corruption in the country, the perceived uh, corruption in the courts in particular will be an interesting topic for you. You look at the infrastructure of this uh, country, but these are some of the regulatory indicators that basically tell you nobody in their right mind will invest in, uh, in Greece in this kind of uh, situation. You can go through the same exercise in Portugal and find it slightly better, but it's still not a very friendly place to do uh, business. Uh, go to uh, Spain, do the same, go through Cyprus, where actually they have low taxes, as I mentioned so far, but as part of this agreement that was just signed with the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund and the European Commission, where taxes will be increasing very uh, rapidly. But there is one statistic that I remember from Cyprus, which is uh, has always said that they're very proud of their uh, commercial court system because it is inherited from the British uh, Empire. The Brits are good at making courts. So I checked their statistic. It turns out that for a basic commercial dispute, you need 735 um, days and 43 procedures in, uh, in uh, Cyprus. I can tell you that the Bulgarian uh, court system is not one of our best points of uh, sale to investors, but it's a lot better than the one in, uh, uh, in Cyprus. So we, I'll show you Georgia in a moment. Yes, yes. Sir. What about the return on investment? Well, it's a very, so that tells you that the few people who are courageous enough uh, to invest in these countries must have fairly high uh, returns, right? Because not many people uh, Go, uh, go in. So there are some people who have high returns. The question is, this is getting us a little bit out of the uh, topic, but I have view on this. Who are these investors? Who are so brave? So I'll just give uh, random uh, guesses. So um, one type of investor is actually an investor that somehow knows the government well, because they don't have so many risks uh, uh, involved. These can be very good investors, uh, for example, uh, nephews, sons, uh, brothers, sisters, and so on of, uh, of high government officials in the sense that they know exactly what's happening in the country. And they also know what's happening, uh, hopefully, sometime in the future in this country. Uh, the problem is not only from Greece and these countries, but worldwide uh, tells you that these people typically are not probably the most entrepreneurial people, they are not the most educated people to do business, um, they are people that just belong to the right uh, families. So as a result, they have high returns, but they may not be in the types of business that is, let's say, the future of a particular uh, country, simply because they didn't fight to get uh, there. Who else may be uh, part of uh, this type of uh, people? They may also be foreigners. Foreigners who, for example, have paid a lot of money, probably some of it uh, in Cyprus bank accounts or somewhere else, to be uh, there. And in fact, uh, I, I'm sure that you follow the news from Portugal, from Spain, from Greece. Now in the crisis, suddenly there, are a lot, there is a lot more information of corrupt government officials, their families, um, uh, in fact, the other news today from Cyprus is that in these few days of last week that uh, the banks were closed, uh, the family of the current president managed to take out of the closed banks 21 million uh, euro. That's just international news. It may not be true, but if it is true, it tells you the type of uh, stuff that the people who have uh, high returns may... Uh, may gain at the, at the expense of everybody else. But I take your point, even in these countries there are some businesses that are successful. The question is how many of them can there be? Uh, uh, and uh, especially if you have smaller families so you don't have 20 nephews to do business and, uh, and uh, so on. Um, I'm also not saying, by the way, that just the business regulation is all of the um, solution for these countries. I'm just making the point that if you move from the purely fiscal and monetary discussion, which so far has prevailed in Europe, and you ask the question, okay, suppose that we actually want to develop businesses in these countries, how do you go about it? And you see this statistic, you have a much bigger problem because even if there are large fiscal transfers, even if somehow this financial crisis ends, uh, then a few years down the road you're going to have yet another crisis. And I go back to, to my uh, first discussion on, um, 
on uh, the euro. Why were all of these economists saying that the euro is not a very viable concept in, uh, uh, even in the late 90s? Actually, because of this, they were saying two things. First, they were saying what I just told you, that there is no free capital labor uh, mobility, that fiscal trans transfers for political reasons cannot be large enough to keep the people uh, uh, there. By the way, then they were showing the example of southern and northern Italy, and they're saying, look at you at Italy, it works there because northern Italy roughly produces, southern Italy consumes, so everybody has uh, a family member in southern Italy that sort of keep their uh, dacha or villa there, and from time to time you go to the south, but just to spend money, the south of Italy, this is in the late 60s, uh, the story and 70s, doesn't produce much, but it somehow still manages to stay uh, relatively uh, well to do within Italy because northern Italy pays enough in terms of transfers for southern Italy to stay. But the same cannot be true, it was argued then, and it is very obvious now from the political discussions, it cannot be true for Germans being very willing, or British or French be, being very willing to spend more and more money so that uh, uh, Greeks can be, uh, uh, can be well uh, fed and well educated and so on. So that's the one argument that we've already discussed and that's all in the media. The main argument for economists had nothing to do with that, it was the so-called optimal currency area argument. Robert Mandel won a Nobel Prize for this, um, for his papers from the early 60s, and it basically says, if you want to create a currency, um, first of all, it's not obvious that every country has to have its own currency, because if you think historically, actually countries look differently, not like now. So it's not one country, one, uh, one currency. But you need to look at the economic fundamentals of countries and say which countries, roughly speaking, belong to each other. And their economic criteria, they have to be roughly of the same uh, income and the same uh, economic uh, structure. This already is not true for much of Europe. So if you think of Europe, you can say so then Germany, Austria, Finland, uh, Sweden, um, uh, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and so on, belong to an optimal currency area. You can calculate who belongs and who doesn't there by now. Uh, very easy statistics. But then Spain, Portugal, Greece, and so on, certainly don't belong to the same currency area if you look at the uh, economics. Uh, and how can you become part of the same currency area? Well, when you become more competitive. Basically, you need to become richer first. How do you become richer? By being more productive. How do you become more productive? By, uh, by having more business. So the second argument that I'm giving you is actually the more fundamental economic argument, which is nothing new. This is what Robert Mandel wrote in 1960 61 optimal currency area. This is if you have followed Paul Krugman in his discussion over the last three, four years on uh, the Greek crisis, Portuguese crisis, and so on. Basically, he's always going back and saying, 50 years ago, 1961, Mandel told you why this is not an optimal currency area, and it would have periodic problems, meaning even if this current problem is resolved, 10 years from now, part of Europe will have again a similar problem, but they're not competitive enough to be part of the same uh, currency. This latter one, um, Europe does not recognize yet, or at least doesn't want to recognize yet, and I've had many discussions with the German finance minister, with um, a number of other top politicians in uh, Brussels, and when you get to this point and say, well, actually, you have a very fundamental problem of competitiveness of some of these countries, they don't really belong to the same currency area as the, the other countries. And at that point, politicians say, this is a political decision, so we cannot discuss it. Which is, you know, if something cannot be explained, you say it's a political decision and it's easily explainable. <laughs> Politicians can take unreasonable, um, unreasonable decisions and that's perfectly uh, fine. But the discussion so far has been exactly that. The creation of the uh, Eurozone and then the acceptance of a number of countries in uh, the Eurozone is a political decision and hence, uh, hence you do not uh, need it. And I'll finish with the third shortest um, uh, argument, which I will show you the, thank you, just show you the Georgia statistics, which probably by now you know, but uh, um, I'll do that in a moment. But it gets to the point, so the Eurozone 
The countries in the Eurozone have very big problems, as we've just discussed. A number of countries now have essentially gone bankrupt and uh, needed some, uh, some assistance. There are some others, like Slovenia, which probably very soon will uh, require assistance. There are others, like France and Italy and Spain, that are large enough, so you hope that they don't require external assistance. But Spain said it doesn't require external assistance, and then it asked for some, so you're never sure whether they will need uh, and also the Eurozone has a number of issues which we've described. Countries in the European Union, outside of the Eurozone, like Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, Latvia, Lithuania, and so on, are linked through foreign direct investment and through uh, these transfers that I mentioned and through trade to the Eurozone. Bulgaria, for example, exports about 60% of its products to the Eurozone. So we care very much whether the Eurozone is doing well or uh, not. But there are also a number of other countries, like Georgia, that if you look at the trade statistics, I am sure uh, that uh, at least half of your trade goes to Europe. I don't know whether somebody knows the statistics here. One, one third goes to, to Europe or just to the Eurozone? No, EU. EU, okay. But it's still a substantial part of your, of your trade. Uh, but the same is true for investment. So the difference between European investors investing here or not partly is due to, of course, how they perceive the local environment, business as well as political certainty. And to some extent it depends on how safe they, they feel with their um, investments. At the moment, European investors don't feel safe at all anywhere, not, not just in Bulgaria or Greece or Georgia and so on. Most, most people who have money just stay put on their money, keep them in the banks, don't use them until better times come. But if nobody is using their monies, actually better times don't come because nobody is uh, investing and we are now in this situation for about five, uh, uh, five years. When the time comes to invest money though, People will be looking for the type of things that I just showed you in the case of Greece. Would I go and invest in Greece? If I look at these statistics, probably uh, no. If I look at their statistics, Greece has one other feature, Bulgaria being a neighbor of Greece, we suffer from that a lot. Every week somebody is on strike. Agricultural workers are on strike, transport workers are on uh, strike, teachers are on strike, the media goes on strike uh, so that it doesn't say who else is on strike. So basically everybody is on strike. And this is a big problem if you're an investor, if you're a tourist, because you don't know if you go to Greece whether actually you'll be stranded on some island without food um, or, um, or, um, or not. And that's why the investors first would look at the type of statistics that are freely available, that they can give you an idea of the country beyond what the media just uh, writes about strikes and political uncertainty and, uh, and so on. The regulatory statistics are one such uh, uh, data that for the last 10 years or so have been guide, and I personally have seen this by discussing with many uh, investors around the world have been a guide for the larger investors whether they go somewhere or not. Greece probably not. I'll finish with showing you the data for Georgia, which as you know last year, I think in the latest report, became uh, there's probably a faster way to do this, but I haven't done it for some time. last year became overall number nine in the world of 185 countries. Uh, Bulgaria, to give you an example, is somewhere at, I'm embarrassed to say, but somewhere around 67th, something like that, 65. We beat Romania, Romania, which is most important for us. If you beat Romania, if you beat Serbia, if you beat Greece, your immediate neighbors, then uh, then uh, you are uh, fine, but uh, look at... Uh, the ranks are from the bottom. Number one is the, the best, so number 185, I think it's Gabon or something like, uh, like that. Um, so this is, let me see the starting of business, since I showed you this data with uh, Greece. So it takes two procedures, basically go to two places uh, probably, or you may not need to go to two places. It takes two days. Here the, uh, 
uh, methodology for each procedure gives you a day, so even if you can do it in a single day, we assume that you're more like Greece, so you go do a procedure and then you go drink coffee, so you don't do the second procedure, you go the next day. Uh, and it basically costs you nothing, next to nothing. There is paid in capital, which is zero, and there is some cost, which is about 4% of GDP, which, uh, which is little. So just look, if you just compare one country to another, you say, here is where I'm going to invest. Because nobody looks just at starting a business, they look at, at a variety of things. The things that most investors look, we've done some analysis with this in the past, curiously, the starting a business index, even though it typically doesn't cost much at all, even for large invest, investors, they care about it. It's some sort of a indicator that they think, okay, how do I go about it? I start a business, then uh, what do I do? Well, I need to enforce contracts. I need to make sure that when I argue with my partners, I have a way to uh, succeed in the court. So they always look at enforcing contracts. They always look at um, uh, building permits because for most businesses you would uh, want to uh, build your own uh, business. They look at uh, They look at paying taxes. For small economies, they always look at trading across borders, how easy it is for, for you to export and uh, import. Um, and a variety of these uh, indicators, what's not here, because it's mostly a, a perception indicator, is uh, the index of corruption. There are several indexes that exist uh, on corruption around the world. None of them are particularly uh, accurate because there is a large order of subjectivity into that, but most uh, most investors, when you ask them, first they always say there are three things that we look What are the taxes and the tax system? What is the court system, both in terms of efficiency, this shows the efficiency, and in terms of corruption, which to some extent, of course, is related to how slow on average and uh, procedural the process is, because the more procedures you have, the more people can ask you for bribes, but also has some other uh, beyond these indicators uh, things. And thirdly, most businesses also worry about infrastructure, including not just the roads, but worry about electricity. Am I going to have electricity? Um, uh, is it uh, always available? Or do I sometimes have electricity shortages? In fact, I remember I first came to Georgia in 90s, the winter of 97, 98, um, and there was no electricity much of the, the day. Uh, for two or three months, so I still remember that uh, early, early start. Uh, and that certainly makes an impression on, uh, on investors. Georgia has gone a long way from these, uh, these days, and I hope that will continue, not just on these indicators, but on uh, many other uh, indicators. But the point that I'll finish with is that what's happening in the Eurozone has an indirect, of course, effect, but has a very large effect through the investment and through the trade uh, channel uh, to uh, countries like Georgia. And this is why I hope that you follow with interest what is happening uh, there, because it has uh, uh, a lot of uh, influences on what happens here in terms of economic growth. Uh, but also because over time it may uh, show how United Europe will be more competitive, including uh, Georgia, will be more competitive to the United States, to China, to Brazil, and uh, so on. I'll finish here, and if we have room for questions, time I mean for questions, we do. Please. You mentioned uncompetitiveness um, of um, European countries and its tropical. We see it, uh, if we look at um, data of UK, uh, there is increase in employment, but there is decrease, uh, there is no uh, the increase in GDP, which means that there is a fall in productivity. Uh, but there is, um, we could say that um, uh, supply side uh, supply side policies are quite bad there because there are quite high um, welfare payments and people are not looking uh, there to find a job because they have quite um, high payments. Also, there is uh, NHS which is free healthcare and um, 
which, uh, which is uh, almost 20% of all uh, government spending. Uh, but on the other hand, it will be political suicide for any party which will abolish NHS. And uh, how do you see, um, how can they change uh, supply side in European countries? In your opinion, in general, you're just giving me the example of the United Kingdom. That uh, so, in other words, should we discuss United Kingdom as an example, or you want more more broadly? Um, so, United Kingdom is uh, I didn't mention it because it's not part of the eurozone, but it is also undergoing a very severe uh, recession. They entered the uh, uh, crisis somewhat later than the the rest, um, and to some extent were. Uh, hoping that uh, they would they would manage to avoid most of it. It just came delayed by about uh, two years or so. So in fact, last year they had a fairly deep uh, recession. This year the UK is going to have a, a recession and probably next year. In fact, as of the end of 2012, the seven largest economies, sorry, the seven largest economies in Europe all are in, uh, probably you've put it on, Uh, as of the end of 2012, the seven largest economies in Europe are all simultaneously in a recession, which has actually never happened in recorded uh, history, not just in the last 100 years, but there are statistics for about 200, 250 years, including various colony, colony periods and so on. It's the first time last year, and actually this year, the first quarter of uh, this year, that uh, UK, Germany, France, Italy, uh, Spain, the Netherlands are all simultaneously in a, in a recession. And that makes this year probably more difficult than the previous year in terms of overall outlook in uh, Europe. Something that certainly I didn't believe would happen. I thought that last year and the year before were bad enough so that it's finally time to have some positive views, but it doesn't look, um, look that way. But your question is uh, actually a lot of people are asking it, but politicians don't really like to answer uh, it much. Um, Europe has gotten to a point, because it was a, 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 rich, uh, a rich place to begin with, um, and as a result, but also of the Second World War and the way that uh, economies and societies emerged from the Second World War, with a lot larger social welfare state that either the United States or uh, Asia, which it compares to. In the US, uh, healthcare is also fairly inefficient. It accounts to nearly 20% as well, uh, social, uh, uh, in terms of social spending, it's like 17% also. But you have a system which is not perfect, but somewhat works of, uh, of uh, insurance, and the rest of the social uh, sector, particularly higher education, university education in the US, is a lot more developed, let's say, than uh, in Europe. So to some extent, it and is in private hands, by and large. So it balances out the inefficiencies in the health uh, uh, healthcare sector. Asia doesn't have a large social welfare system, neither in education, actually a lot of universities are private, um, and uh, a lot of healthcare in Asia is private as well, so it doesn't weigh so much on, uh, on the uh, government uh, budget. While in Europe, on average, uh, you mentioned some of the uh, figures, but just the social side, that excludes defense, for example, which is also fairly expensive, police, which is also fairly expensive, the court system, which is fairly expensive, just the uh, so social welfare side, health, pensions, uh, uh, education accounts for something like 40% of overall uh, uh, spending on average, and this excludes some countries or includes some countries with 60, 65%. What to do with it? Well, they, this is a big question. It is the other side of competitiveness. So, how do you become uh, competitive? One way is to uh, one way is to make it easy. And the microphone is not here. I think it's your. Oh, the cat issue. Cat issue. Uh, one way is to make it easier for businesses to operate, which, which we discuss. And long term, this is the only way because it's the private sector that generates the most uh, jobs and. Uh, uh, creates the most uh, uh, value added. Short term, you can do it by basically making your 
public sector more efficient. In fact, when I became a finance minister about four years ago, this is what I was bringing, because I realized that the crisis is coming, so you cannot really create a lot more employment and a lot more um, opportunities for business just because we depend so much on the rest of, uh, of Europe. So long term, I can make some regulatory changes. So for example, we reduced the cost of starting a business from at the time it was nearly 3,000 euro. It became one euro. So for one euro, you can now establish a business in Bulgaria. But while there were more businesses established than in the past, also more businesses closed down because the of the business uh, cycle. But what we did manage to do is, for example, some of the reforms that you also have done here over the last uh, five, eight years. We um, increased uh, the mandatory pension age. So as a result, we saved some from, uh, from paying page pensions in Bulgaria as in many countries in Europe. And uh, in a number of sectors, you have early retirement. So for example, our police can retire at 42. Uh, uh, people who have worked in the police, people who have worked in the army can retire at 43, 45, depending on the type of work that they do, and then they have another 40 years that, uh, of life, which is good, of course, for them and the country, but they are on the public uh, payroll. So we managed to increase a bit the uh, retirement uh, age. We did a number of uh, things to restrict, uh, essentially, the budget that goes to the military for example, and saved from that to go and uh, spend more money on, uh, on uh, education. But still, as a share of GDP, Bulgarian public expenditure is actually the lowest currently in the European Union, together with Latvia, with 36, 37 percent. As you mentioned, some countries at 60, 65, even 70 percent, as the case of France. The only way that they can go about is having the same type of reforms, pension reforms, so rapidly increased. Uh, the number of years that uh, one needs to produce, basically to be a, a worker uh, before they retire. This is an unpleasant reform. Typically, who does it gets expelled from uh, office or doesn't get uh, to win the next uh, election. Healthcare reforms, what you mentioned. Perhaps together with pension reforms, the most, uh, the two most important things, because Bulgaria, it's not necessary, uh, because uh, Europe has rapidly aging population, so if you have more older people, what do they need? Well, they need health care, they need pensions. So if you somehow manage to, uh, uh, to reform these two areas, you buy yourself some years to do the other competitiveness changes. In Bulgaria, I mentioned, we managed to do pension reform. I'm quite happy with that even though it was very painful. Um, it didn't succeed once, it succeeded on the second go. Healthcare reform we didn't manage to do. We tried it four times, we changed four different ministers, so we fired, hired and fired four different ministers, healthcare ministers to do uh, healthcare reform, and we did not succeed. Somehow the lobby against reform was so large that they immediately converged and start uh, watering down the, the changes. So I hope that in the next term, one would be able to do that. But without that, Europe is basically doomed because it competes with Asia, which doesn't have this, uh, uh, this uh, heavy cost, and it competes with uh, the US, which has some of that, but to a much less extent than, uh, than Europe. Other questions? <coughs> Can I ask you a question uh, about your major accomplishments as a Minister uh, of Finance and Prime Minister? Since I was also deputy president, so the finance side is uh, to some extent my main uh, business, but it's not very glorious because every finance minister, if he has studied finance, uh, knows what to do, so basically try to balance the budget to the extent uh, possible. So my major achievement as a finance minister that I got, Bulgaria has always been a relatively disciplined uh, financially public finance uh, economy, but still the previous socialist-led uh, government to win the elections in 2009 had sort of spent a lot more money than they admitted to. So in 2009, we had a deficit of 4.4%, which by Bulgarian standards, given that we also have a currency board, so we have to run a balanced budget, was quite high. Last year, we ended 2012 with the third lowest deficit in uh, the European Union of about less than half a percentage point. So Germany barely beat us, and Sweden was at a balanced budget. So there are many ingredients to why you can get a balanced budget. Um, 
but basically in finance, I'm quite happy that in four years we managed to get a balanced budget. Of course, any finance minister will tell you that you become deeply unpopular that <laughs> if you manage to cut expenditures. So um, I did it being the second most unpopular minister on the government. The social minister beat me. I don't know how he managed to, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, that was that. But in the area of deputy prime minister, where I was responsible for most of the all of the uh, environment, uh, agriculture, economy, industry, healthcare, social, and so on uh, ministries, uh, I was responsible for this ministry as well. We we had a number of other things that. Uh, did work and many that didn't. Uh, one that I mentioned, pension reform, was extremely difficult. The labor unions were very against any type of reform. They managed to stop it once in 2010 and in 2011 with exactly the same reform. We managed to actually go through. They were just too tired to fight on that particular. One plus I had learned something also actually from my work early in Georgia. I've advised many governments uh, as my previous job at the World Bank is that if you open many fronts, so if you, instead of doing one reform, you open three reform fronts at the same time, it exhausts your energy, but it also exhausts the energy of the people who are against the reforms, because they have to focus on one or another. So our pension reform basically worked, because at the same time, we also started healthcare reform. Uh, the people against the reforms focus on healthcare, and somehow pension the second time uh, uh, passed. But there are a number, uh, Healthcare, we failed, as I mentioned. We tried three times, uh, we uh, failed. Um, there are a number of smaller things that you would not naturally think uh, when you go to government that this is what I want to be remembered with. One that I was reminded today we managed to ban uh, smoking in public places. It took three, three times, three uh, fights to do it, and then we managed in the end to do it, and we managed actually to uphold it both in the courts and when the opposition tried to get rid of, uh, rid of it. So now in Bulgaria, when you go to a restaurant, you cannot actually uh, smoke in the restaurant. You need to go, uh, to go um, out. Why is this uh, an interesting reform? Well, from a finance point of view, it actually is not an interesting uh, reform, but from a healthcare point of view, you look at the number of cancer patients in the country and you see if you manage to reduce smoking even by a little bit, over time it will start uh, paying off. But this was furiously thought um, against uh, reform um, from all kinds of uh, of groups uh, on all kinds of levels. But this is in, you know, in the national identity to smoke whatever you want, uh, and that uh, it brings extra revenues, uh, which actually is true. But then people discount how much you lose for the healthcare of treating these patients, and uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so this is one thing. Uh, I'll probably in this uh, term be remembered uh, mostly, however, by not what I did, but what I managed to get rid of, which is that Bulgaria had uh, as inheritance some very heavy energy-related uh, projects, some pipeline projects, some nuclear power stations, uh, and so on, that were signed by previous governments. And these were both uh, sink on the economy. For example, we had a project that was a pipeline um, for um, oil going from uh, uh, basically Russia to our port of Burgas to Alexandropolis in Greece to avoid uh, Bosphorus, avoid going through the Bosphorus, which both environmentally didn't make any sense and would have cost Bulgaria nearly $2 billion. I thought we are not going to spend this kind of money on this kind of an environmental uh, hazard. It was thought the last time I went to Parliament, actually, the last day of, uh, of the term of uh, the Parliament, I managed to get rid of this uh, project. So, in other words, you get some things that you install and are new and you hope they will work well, but you also, in uh, government, often stop stupid things from happening, and this is one of the most stupid things that I've seen in recent Bulgarian history, and I'm very proud that I managed to get rid of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting lecture indeed. Uh, speaking of the European financial crisis, uh, three very controversial uh, questions come into mind. First, what if Greece collapse? I mean defaults. Uh, second, what if Greece decides to leave the Eurozone? And the third, uh, what if uh, German PRNs 
or some other European relatives get impatient and decide to expel police from the Eurozone. Uh, can you uh, please, could you please uh, discuss the likelihood of, the, of these questions and the possible far in terms of reasonableness of economic arguments on this, but any reasonable economist would tell you that actually it's not just better for the Eurozone if a country like Greece leaves, but it's strictly better for the economy of Greece, because then they can devalue, um, uh, and we've seen through devaluations how instead of in seven years or ten years, which would take Greece to uh, pull out of this uh, crisis, but in a matter of a year or two, their economy can actually pull up temporarily because they still need to do a lot of regulatory change that they haven't um, uh, made. But for the Greek people, for their economy, it's probably better currently not to be in the Eurozone. From a strictly economics perspective, I, uh, uh, I stress. But then it becomes a political issue at two levels. One is the great concept, the grander concept of United Europe that if one country leaves, then you show that you're not sure about this concept, uh, if you're a European politician. <coughs> on that argument, the top politicians in Europe, let's say, have always argued with me, we were not going to let anybody to uh, fail, we're going to struggle to the end. If you're the government of Greece or Cyprus or Portugal and so on, you also don't want to be known as the government that exited from uh, the Eurozone, because that would also be seen as a political failure on uh, your own. So that's why over such a long period, so many meetings, so many um, discussions have been uh, within that construct, what can we do? And it's mostly seen, as you said, that by now people have what's called a bailout fatigue. So they're just fed up having countries that come and say, we need your help. It was seen in Cyprus. Cyprus was treated a lot harsher than anybody else has been treated uh, so far, both in terms of words. I mean, imagine somebody telling another country that you're a casino economy, how that uh, feels, but actually a very prominent member of the French uh, government, their finance minister, said this a week ago about uh, Cyprus. Um, I told you some of the other uh, comments. So clearly people are starting to lose patience, but somehow this patience would always, in my view, be lost within the construct of we keep them in the Eurozone and we try to make uh, corrections uh, within that. And this is actually why I told you this whole story of the Eurozone. That, however, cannot happen. So it's not feasible that all of the current members of the Eurozone can continue being in the Eurozone within the current rules of the Eurozone, simply because it's not just a matter of having good monetary policy, it's not just a matter of having good and common fiscal policy, which doesn't exist by now, uh, by the way. Even that's not enough. You need to see the underlying causes of why these countries fail, and they don't fail just because they spend more money than they have. They also fail and will be failing because they are not competitive relative to, to the core, Germany, uh, the Netherlands and so on. And so far, nobody has an answer to this question. More importantly, it's only in the last two or three months, basically once we saw that beyond Greece, Italy is starting to have problems, um, Cyprus is uh, having problems, Slovenia is next having problems. In other words, this would be going on and on for some time in Europe. Only now people are starting to recognize the second part, which I told you. But we don't only look at monetary and fiscal, we need to look at the regulations. And so far, Europe has not been able to admit that actually it's not a very good regulatory environment for doing business. And as somebody mentioned there, that it has a fairly bloated public sector, especially on the social welfare side, that it cannot sustain with its current levels of uh, competitiveness. But your questions always have been avoided so far. And my prediction is for some time they will be avoided until there is um, some answer to the point of competitiveness, uh, how that is going to be increased over time within the European Union. But that discussion is only now starting after nearly five years of, uh, of uh, hard work. Maybe one more? Or, uh, Uh, and uh, how, competitive, uh, how competitive is Georgia with the other uh, European countries? Do we have something to give Europe uh, in comparison with uh, Greece or other countries? Uh, well, so 
on, on the regulatory side, which underlies much of uh, competitiveness, as I just showed you, uh, Georgia is uh, among the top 10 countries in, uh, in the world, and among these top 10 countries, probably there are another two or three European countries, most of these, uh, Singapore, uh, US, and so on, among the top uh, 10, so there are probably a total of two or three European countries in the top uh, 10 which basically tells you that on the regulatory side, as of last year though, um, as of the middle of last year, last June, uh, Georgia is doing uh, quite well, has built over time uh, quite a good uh, regulatory environment. As I mentioned, that's not all that, uh, that investors look at. They look at uh, uh, infrastructure of all kinds, uh, electricity infrastructure, um, utilities infrastructure, ports, um, roads and so on to basically estimate whether they'll be able to move goods from uh, the country to other places and of course from other places to uh, the country. So one would need to look at the infrastructure indicators. And the other set of indicators that you always always look as, at the, uh, as an investor is the efficiency and lack of corruption in the judiciary because sooner or later you're going to have an issue with uh, one of your contractors, business partners, and, uh, and uh, so on. And each one of these can become the bottleneck. For example, in Bulgaria, we actually have not had any of these free until, until very recently. In other words, we had fairly bad infrastructure by European standards. The courts were fairly corrupt. This is in the reports of the European um, Union. And as I just mentioned on uh, reg the regulatory side, we didn't have we're about average. Uh, in the European Union. So we started working on some of the regulatory side where we succeeded and some that we did not uh, succeed. We've worked in building a lot of road infrastructure and that will be probably the biggest success um, in terms of what you see from our term in uh, government. But even now the latest report of the European Union tells that in the case of the courts we still have uh, large incidents of, I don't maybe say corruption exactly, but large incidents of um, inefficiencies, let's say. Uh, and that is an issue for, uh, for uh, investors. I'm not very familiar, the reason I give the Bulgarian example, I don't know much about the court system here in uh, Georgia, but these are the three things uh, investors would look. Regulatory environment very good as of last year, I mean among the best in the world. Uh, court system I'm not familiar with, infrastructure I know that there has been a lot of, um, of uh, build-up and this is why incidentally if you look purely at the macro statistics until last year, Georgia has done quite well. The growth was way above the average in the European, uh, uh, on the European continent, which means that, uh, that uh, there are enough things and not just Borjomi and wine and so on that, uh, that uh, uh, Georgia is producing. Your question is more relevant in this picture that I've just described, but imagine that Europe is not going to grow on average for another two to five years, which actually is very uh, possible, not only possible, but this is the current uh, forecast that for the next, let's say, five years, Europe is not going to be uh, having growth, or if it has growth, on average, it's going to be like half a percent to a percent growth. Then countries like Georgia not only have to be competitive, but they have to continuously beat other competitors, not only in Europe, but in countries around uh, Europe, so that with very stagnant uh, markets economically, you continue to gain more than you've had before, so that your, your um, economic rate is higher than the rest of Europe. Otherwise, imagine if you have for five years uh, an economic growth rate of 1%. Right? So, not going to get a developing economy, emerging market uh, very, very far. And what are these uh, uh, sources of growth within Georgia that in some sense we don't have yet, but we now have, uh, have a prospect for developing? It's not very clear. I have been discussing it with some of your professors and some of the policy makers here from uh, yesterday. Um, don't have a very good view, but frankly, I don't have a very. I've been asking this question myself for the case of Bulgaria, for example. So, what are these things that we are good at, but we can do a lot more, given that now Europe is not going to uh, grow very, 
uh, very uh, fast. And the answer, I'll just finish with this, the answer frequently ends up being, you see in economic history, if you look at East Asia, what it's done, the US, what he's, uh, has done lately, is not necessarily completely new sectors. So you're not actually thinking of how we are suddenly going to develop a big new sector. You're thinking of sectors that uh, Georgia, let's say, traditionally has been good, but suddenly can do a lot more of it and become, let's say, a world leader or uh, a European uh, leader. It turns out that in economic history in the last 30 to 50 years, in crisis, this is what happens. You don't actually break into new industries and suddenly become uh, very good. You have some traditional industries that you have a step up and from that, suddenly take a larger market than you otherwise would have uh, been. What these are, probably you know better. Is that maybe one final? Thank you. Uh, my question is about the rationale of doing business, easiness of doing business. Um, let's say, let's take an example of China, and China's ranking is 91, as I remember, and it's not improving, uh, like it's not improved from the previous ranking. And uh, in terms of economic growth, GDP per capita growth last 20 years is the fastest growing uh, economy in the, in the world. And uh, my question is about the correlation, if there's any study, about the correlation of easiness of doing business and the economic growth, um, and how we explain the case of China. And second question is a little bit related to that first question. Uh, I, I have the feeling that uh, economic uh, system uh, has some compatibility issues between economic system uh, and the political system world today has. What I mean here is that uh, the, the economic system uh, motivates the businesses, investors, to invest in places where their individual uh, benefit is higher. That's one of uh, how we can explain why investors from uh, the US closing their businesses and then opening in China. And uh, when we're talking about to saving the, our country's economy, it somehow contradicts the first thing, you know, because um, the, how, how US and Europe were the, the living level, I mean, uh, uh, quality of life is much higher, uh, compete with the China with the, the labor uh, cost is very low, despite the fact that easiness is much higher in Europe and the US. It is a top 10 and uh, China is 91. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So on the first question, the answer is that if you do a reasonably rigorous economic analysis, the link between economic growth and the ease of doing business is very high. The correlation is something like 82% or so 0.82. Why is that the case? Because in doing this correlation you need to adjust for a few things, but you certainly need to adjust for initial conditions, initial economic conditions, and market size. So when people, especially I've had many discussions with uh, Chinese government officials, which for obvious reasons are not very happy with the Doing Business Index, and they always say, we attract so many uh, trillions of US dollars of foreign investment a year, plus we have the highest growth. And the argument to them is the following. Well, you have 800 million people living in your villages. You so far have moved 300 million of these people from the villages to the cities where they have become more productive. You have another half a billion people to move from your village, which they produce nothing basically, to the cities. And until you move these people from the village to the cities, you're going to be more productive and you're going to grow faster than everybody else. But first, you cannot move everybody to the cities because it creates a big social issue. And uh, this movement, anyhow, is finite. We've seen it in economic history of how from an agrarian society, which China was 30 years ago, you become a manufacturing uh, society. And then what happens? Then you suddenly stop, uh, stop uh, growing. And again, in history, we have many examples of uh, countries like that. 
But the example of China, even the US is misleading because they have such large market size internally that they basically can invest just in themselves uh, without caring too much about the rest of, uh, of, uh, of the world, at least for longer periods of, uh, of time and of attracting foreign investment. China, in fact, doesn't need foreign investment at all. The uh, size of the outward foreign direct investment, in other words, how, how much money Chinese citizens send outside of China to hide it or to use it, uh, however, is larger for the last three years than the amount of money going into, into China. There is enough capital by now, in other words, in, uh, uh, in China so that they can uh, grow. But this large market and the fact that they started from $300 per capita to grow gives them a lot higher uh, higher uh, economic rate of growth than uh, richer, uh, richer countries. But it's not, as I mentioned, uh, infinite. The key example of that is Japan, actually. By now, you probably are too young to remember the 80s when everybody was very afraid of Japan. The US was extremely afraid of, uh, of Japan, how competitive it has become, how fast it was uh, growing. Uh, uh, Japan became richer on average than, uh, than the US in 1982 and then in 84, 98, just two years after that, it suddenly stopped growing and, uh, and Japan for the last 20 years, it's a striking actually statistic, for the last 20 years Japan has not grown, it has zero economic growth for 20 years, sometimes it grew, sometimes it uh, was in a depression, so suddenly now if you think of um, growth uh, factors in the world, you almost never mention Japan. You mention China, you may mention Brazil by now, but you almost ne never mention uh, Japan. But if you look in the 60s to the 80s, Japan was today's China. It was growing very fast, it was moving people to the, uh, to the factories, and then at some point it, uh, it, uh, it stops. So if you exclude these initial conditions and economic uh, size of your market, which matters, the larger your size, the less you should care about these indicators, and the opposite. The smaller market you are, the more you depend on the rest of the world for trade and for investment, the more you should care about these, uh, uh, these uh, indicators. The statistics are actually quite striking, 0.82 uh, connection. Then your second question is, of course, a much deeper philosophical uh, Question. So what happens for countries like the US that, or, or Europe that already are a lot richer, but their uh, price of um, labor is a lot, uh, a lot higher, so everything moves to uh, China. Well, as I already mentioned, that process stops at some point. So 40 years ago everything was moving to Japan, then 20 years ago everything was moving to Korea and Malaysia, now everything is moving to China that process will also stop, and it will stop actually very soon. In fact, just last week, the Forbes uh, uh, 500, together with uh, the EU uh, Confederation of Industries, uh, did a survey that basically asked the question, this is the largest corporations in the world, it asked them the question, where would your next plan be? Where would you build your next production uh, facility? If you go just 10 years ago to... Uh, uh, to the beginning of this century, 2002-2003, 9 out of 10 said China. And actually the 10th one was India. So basically, 10 years ago, if you ask the largest corporations where they will build your next plan, 9 would say China, 1 would say India. If you ask just uh, a week ago, only 3 said uh, China. 4 said the US, in fact. Very interesting. So there's a lot of manufacturing going back to the US. Why? Because of it's essentially it's called technology, not only, it's uh, political stability uh, matters uh, uh, a lot. Many people don't believe that China will be very stable in another 10 or 15 years with this type of political system and this type of uh, economic system. But there is one big technological advance that in the meantime happened in the US in the last few years, which is shale gas. So gas now in, uh, in the US is a quarter of the price than it was three years ago. And suddenly you have industries in Michigan, Wisconsin, Louisiana, Florida, that you had completely lost, like the car manufacturing in Wisconsin and Michigan. And now it's actually at a larger level than it was 20, 20, 30 years ago. So I think increasingly in the world, the price of labor is less important and <coughs> the price of transport becomes less important. 
than the price of, let's say, technological innovation. Now, finding ways to use shale gas is one such example, but there are many other types of, uh, of cheaper energy sources that you can uh, find, uh, and in that way, move production. So just to finish with that. So last week, the largest thousand uh, corporations in the world will ask, where would your next plant be? Three China, four the US, one, Western Europe tells you that West, Western Europe overall, it actually moved to the Netherlands for some uh, uh, reason. And the other two were in Africa. Two said that our next plant would be in Africa. So maybe that's the next frontier. Thank you. Thank you.